welcome to this motion graphics project in which we'll create the animation you just saw using Blackmagic Fusion or DaVinci Resolve if that's how you roll. It's suitable for beginners but I will assume that you know the basics of using Fusion. In the description below you'll find links to the four static images which we'll be layering together. There's also a Fusion comp file of the finished project. The main focus of the project is to create this sort of lens or magnifying glass. Along the way we'll be combining a number of optical effects such as magnification, distortion and others. We'll also touch on a few other topics such as connecting parameters, using depth maps, animating with forward kinematics and finally a sprinkle of particles. It goes without saying that you'll get way more from this video if you fire up Fusion and get your hands dirty. That way you'll definitely get a good workout in Fusion and hopefully you'll have some fun and maybe pick up a few new tricks along the way. So let's get started. Ok we'll start a new composition and in the preferences make sure that it's full HD format and 30 frames per second. The images we'll be using have high dynamic range so let's set the colour depth to 32 bits for good measure. I'll also turn on tile pictures so that you can see what I'm doing. I'll drag in the book background.exr image from Windows Explorer and I can load it in the left viewer by pressing the 1 key. I'll fit to frame and actually I'll get rid of the second viewer for now. By the way I should point out that most EXR images are in linear colour space so they'll look darker than they should when you first load them in Fusion. For this project I converted all the EXRs to Fusion's default colour space which is sRGB so that I don't have to spend 20 minutes explaining lookup tables and cathode ray tubes. So the first effect we're going to create is magnification which relies on an extremely sophisticated visual effects technique called scaling it up. I'll add a transform node from the toolbar and to load it in the viewer I'll press the one hotkey again. Now I can scale the image up and down but the scale slider is a bit twitchy so holding down the control key gives me more precise control. I don't want too much scale so I'll dial in about 1.35 or so. That's scaled the whole image so I'll add an ellipse mask and make the circle a bit smaller. Now as I drag the mask around you can see that the region inside the mask is scaled up which is good but if I pick some feature near the edge of the frame such as the corner of the book and I move the mask over it I'd hope to see that part of the image magnified but all I can see is disappointment. By default the transform node is scaling around the center of the frame so the corner of the book has been scaled right off the edge of the frame. When the mask is up in the corner like that I want the pivot point of the scale effect to be in the same place. So let's connect those together. Thanks to the new voice command feature I can just say into the microphone Fusion connect the scale pivot to the mask position. But in case Fusion responds with I'm sorry Dave I'm afraid I can't do that. We can do it manually instead. Obviously the mask's position is determined by its center parameter because I can see that changing when I drag the mask around. The trick is this I can make that parameter publicly available for other nodes to connect to simply by keyframing it. So I'll right click and choose animate. Because this parameter is a position with x y coordinates keyframing it creates a motion path. Motion paths are shown on the modifiers tab so I'll switch to that and right click to rename it to lens position. Now I can select the transform node, right click on the pivot parameter and choose connect to lens position and position. So now the motion path is connected to two parameters on different nodes, the center parameter on the mask node and the pivot point on the transform node. Now if you select the mask node again and drag it around the image it should magnify the exact region it's on top of. It's starting to look a lot more like a magnifying glass. Not bad for a scrawny little transform node. While I'm dragging it around it's easy to see the effect but if I move it over the red fabric and then deselect everything it's like where did it go? So this is a good time to bring in the frame around the lens. I'll just add the overlay lens.exr image and I'll layer it on top of everything else by dragging its output knot onto the output knot of the transform node. I'll keep it over on the right side of the flow because more nodes will be arriving shortly and I want this one to come last. Of course I want this to follow the ellipse mask around so I'll select the merge node, right click on the center parameter and choose connect to lens position position. The frame snaps into place and if I select either the merge node or the mask node 
and drag it around in the viewer, the lens frame and the mask now stick together. I'll just zoom in a bit and adjust the size of that ellipse mask so that it fits the frame. That's better. OK, that's it for magnification. This would be a good time to save your project, because apparently computer programs suddenly stop working sometimes. I think there's even a word for that. To make the lens effect a bit more organic and interesting, let's add some distortion. I'll select the Transform node and open the Tools bin. If you look in the Warp folder of the Tools bin, you'll find a great selection of tools for bending the fabric of space-time, and many of these would give us great results. I suppose that the Lens Distort is an obvious choice, given the name, but it's actually intended mainly for removing and adding the distortion caused by camera lenses. Of course, you can use it creatively too, but in this case I'm going to double-click on the Dent node to add it to the flow. And if you play around with the settings, you can create all sorts of trippy funhouse distortions. OK, stop that. This is serious. So I'll set the type to Sine Dent and reduce the strength to about 0.17. That may seem pretty subtle, but if I drag the center point of the distortion around, the bulge effect is way more obvious. We want the center of the bulge to follow the position of the mask, so we connect it to the motion path just like before. With the Dent node selected, I'll right click on the center parameter and choose Connect to Lens Position Position, and the bulge effect should snap into place. Now, for the size of the bulge, you can drag the manipulator on the Dent node, of course. It's also not a bad idea to connect our ellipse mask to the Dent node, so that the bulge effect never goes outside that region, no matter what. Having said that, I think the bulge looks better with a smaller size, so I'll drag the size down to roughly fit the lens frame. OK, that's it for the Battle of the Bulge. Admittedly, this effect is similar to the earlier magnification effect, but I like the way this bulge effect can turn a straight line, such as the bottom edge of the book, into a curve. While we're on the topic of distortion, this would be a good time to add some imperfections to the glass. If we imagine this lens was ground in the 1800s, we can have fun with adding some smaller bumps and distortions to it. With the Dent node selected, I'll go back to the Warp tools, and this time I'll add a Displace node, which is a real go-to node when it comes to creating glass and refraction effects, because it's so versatile. It lets you distort an image based on the contents of another image. The Displace node doesn't do much until we connect an image to the foreground input, so let's add a Fast Noise node and connect it. By the way, if I create the Fast Noise node when the Displace node is selected, Fusion will assume that I want to merge them. But that's not what I want, so I'll undo that and make sure that no nodes are selected. Actually, I can left-click on an empty part of the flow, and Fusion will place the new node wherever I clicked. Now I can drag the output knot onto the Displace node, and Fusion will correctly guess which input to connect to. We want these imperfections to be quite small, to contrast with the large-scale bulge we already have. So I'll take a look at the fast noise by itself, and I'll crank the scale right up to 30. Now let's switch back to the Displace node and take a look at what it's doing. The Displace node is set to Radial, so if I drag the Refraction Strength slider, you can see that it's scaling pixels out from the center of the image. The white regions of our fast noise will scale pixels quite far, and the black regions won't scale them at all. Even when I set the strength back to the default of 0.1, you can see that there's more distortion around the boundaries of the frame, further from the center. There's actually a manipulator handle to control the center of the displacement, but it's a red handle against a red background, so it's pretty hard to make out, and I'm now starting to regret my original choice of fabric colors. In any case, we need to connect the center of the displacement effect to follow the lens around, so yet again, we'll right-click on the center parameter and connect it to the lens position. And obviously, we need to connect our mask to this new effect, so that only the lens region gets distorted. I've kept the overall effect fairly subtle with a refraction strength of 0.1. You might want to crank it a bit higher, but remember that most of these effects become more noticeable and exaggerated when the lens is moving, as it will be in the final render. There's one last thing I almost forgot. If we're going to be fussy, we actually want the fractal noise pattern to move wherever the lens does, otherwise the imperfections will swim across the surface of the glass when it moves. So connect the center parameter of the fast noise node as well. The next thing we're going to add is some depth of field blur, but doing that reveals a shortcoming with our node graph. Let's throw in an ordinary blur node with a blur size of 10 pixels to see what I'm talking about. We'll replace this with a proper depth of field later. Now let's mask the blur so that the lens region brings focus to the image. 
If I connect it to the existing mask node, it looks blurry inside the lens instead of outside it. That actually looks a bit like frosted glass, but it's not what I'm after, so I'll disconnect that. One approach would be to duplicate the existing mask with copy and paste, connect it to the blur, and invert it. That works okay, but now I have two separate masks, and I'll need to keep their position and other parameters in sync. Of course, we've already looked at connecting parameters, and Fusion also has a feature called instancing, which can help keep duplicate nodes in sync, but that's for another day. And as we add more effects to the glass, such as dirt and reflections, we'll have to connect each one to a mask, and possibly even add more masks. Now, that approach definitely isn't terrible, but I think there's a better solution, which enables us to use a single mask for everything. We can create two parallel branches on our flow. One branch can add all the glass effects to the entire frame, and a second branch can apply all the effects which belong outside the lens frame, such as the blur. Then we can combine these two branches with a merge node and a single mask. This will make the flow much easier to work with as we move forward. Let's go ahead and do that now. I'll maximize the flow panel and get rid of the second mask, which we don't need. I don't want to delete the original mask, but I do want to disconnect it from everything, so I'll shift drag it to do that. Now I'll add a couple of underlay nodes and rename them, one for the lens effects and one for effects surrounding the lens. All the glass effects go on the top branch and the blur goes in the bottom. I also need to reconnect the blur so that its input is the original EXR. Now to layer the top branch on top of the lower branch, I'll drag the last output knots together to automatically create a merge node. I can now connect the ellipse mask to the new merge and I'm done. I'll just tidy up the layout a bit. To make sure that I haven't busted anything, I'll go back to the viewer and drag the mask around. It looks like the magnification, bulge and imperfections are all inside the lens frame and the blur is outside, so hooray for that. Okay that's it for part one. I hope you'll join me in the second and final video in this series, which features unicorn sparkles and a badly proportioned solar system.